Right, folks, uh, welcome back to answers, to speculative answers. These are not the official SQA answers. These are just my guesses, so you, therefore you can't use them to estimate your mark accurately, I'm afraid. At time of recording, the official answers haven't been released yet. Also, please note this is purely for educational use. I cannot get any money out of this channel because it is um, not able to be monetized. So I'm doing this. That means copyright is not a problem. I'm going to nip through this quite quickly. Um, because I can't have too long a video on this. If you want to pause at any time and have a look at my babbling, then you can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm, I'll pay more attention... Whoops, sorry, camera. I will pay more attention to the problem-solving than the simple knowledge stuff. This knowledge stuff, let's move on. Art skills, definitely zero. 2P, electron in oxygen. Complete the table, show one possible set. There are other answers that are valid here. L's got to be one. Um, ML could be others, though. And so could um, S, of course. What do we have here? Trend in ionization energy. Explain in terms of electronic structure. Well, I put two different possible explanations here. There's the SQA's version, which says that half-filled orbitals are uniquely stable. If you go and have a look in ChemGuide, then uh, he or she, I'm not sure who it is, argues that that is not the case. And it's actually to do with the repulsion between electrons once they double up. So in other words, the SQA are saying that nitrogen is actually uh, more stable um, because of the half-filled orbital, whereas ChemGuide are saying oxygen is actually less stable because of the repulsion between these two now paired up electrons, which means that you can kick one off easier. I'm not sure which one would be officially accepted. Probably this one. I wonder if that would be... I can't wait to see the assessor's report. That's sort of the SQA's own report on how well this paper has been done. Yeah... This is a problem-solving question. It's only worth one mark. Just pop the numbers in and you get that. Provided I've done it correctly, of course. That would be embarrassing if I haven't. Uh, number two. It's a calculation for three marks where you have to calculate the feasibility if the reaction is feasible at 298 Kelvin. So what I did was I went ahead and worked out this is what we need, of course. We need this. This is our overall equation, so we need to know delta H, which according to my sums is that. We need to know delta S, which according to my sums is that. Why have I put a question mark there? I did this a while back. Why have I question marked my own calculation? Hmm. I have question marked my own calculation because I thought it was odd that we were getting an increase in entropy when we have two different substances going to make just one. I did seriously doubt myself there. If I have the time and energy, I'll go back and just double check that. According to my calculations, though, um, then that, of course, you have to divide that by 1,000. So I'm getting positive 86.6 kilojoules per mole, which means, according to me, this is not feasible. Again, I will check these, or you can check them. At some point, the SQ will release the official answers, and you can prove me to be an idiot, which is entirely possible. This is... An interesting one, um, because just for a change, there is no mass given in this question. So I think to get your second mark here, you're going to have to put a unit in. So according to my sums, it either comes out to be 600 milligrams or 0 0.6 grams. Uh, complete the table. This was an odd one, I thought. Uh, they're, they're asking for the same concept to be tested twice. Once upon a time, they would never really do that. So they're testing whether you know how to calculate oxidation numbers. Hmm. Don't know why they're doing it twice to get one mark. Maybe they regard it as being too easy. I don't know. Uh, number two. Rate equation. So this is my... Sorry, I misread the question. That's why that's scored out. A uh, rate equation would look something like this. You're only paying attention to the slow step. The fast step is not relevant. Um, there are two uh, nitrogen monoxides and one hydrogen, so therefore that's raised to the power of two, that's the power of one. Small k, remember, if you've got a capital K, you lose your mark, because that means an equilibrium constant. Then they give you the actual value of k, they give you some concentrations, they are getting you to work out, this is an unusual one, I quite like this one, because it's different than normal. They're actually getting you to work out the concentration of the nitrogen monoxide, rather than the rate itself. So this was a fun one. Because um, you've got to do some square roots and so on. 
why did I question mark this? Oh yeah, because it comes out, according to me, although again it could be wrong, comes out to be this number here, which could you round up to just that? Uh, there are only two significant figures in each of these data points given to you, data points, and here as well. So technically speaking, that should be an acceptable answer. Uh, balanced equation. The balanced equation, what you have to do here, guys, is combine uh, these two steps together and you get that, which is what I did in the first place. I'm a Muppet. That's the balanced equation. Number three, hydrofluoric acid. Simple definition time, not even going to talk about that. This one here, calculate pH from this equation here. An easy two marks, actually. Um, don't be messing about with this stuff in real life. Uh, it's really, really nasty. Um, 1.31 is the pH. Uh, where are we? We are here. I've got a question mark for this. Why did I question mark this? Why did I think it was worth two marks? It's one of these horrible percentage by mass questions. So percentage by mass either means um, mass, oh yeah, the definition, the SQA's definition for solutions is the mass per 100 centimetre cubed. And they want 3.75 moles per litre. So that's 3.75 moles per litre, which corresponds to 0 0.375 moles per 100 centimetres cubed. Um, according to my results, that's what we get. But we'll wait and see whether I'm right or not. I thought this was an odd question. Uh, it's actually more like a National 5 question. Uh, because you get something from group four and four things are bonded to it, so it's got to be tetrahedral. I suppose it could be argued under the VSCPR theory as well. Eh? Uh, what's going on here? This is refluxing, this equipment here. I, I thought this was a really nasty one uh, to put in. I mean, it, it's technically speaking, it's a, it's a good one, and the chemistry still asks you how you do these experiments. But, I mean, if you didn't have time to do them, then you might be missing small details like that. Uh, what's going on here? Yeah, salt of hypuric acid treated with hydro, uh, dilute hydrochloric acid, white precipitate of hypuric acid is formed. Explain why adding hydrogen ions to the salt of weak acid results in the formation of undissociated weak acid molecules. Well, you're going to have these floating around. This is the weak acid of hypuric acid. Sorry, this is, I apologise, this is the conjugate base. So this is effectively the, the, the counter ion of the hydrogen from the weak acid. Now, if you add hydrogen ions, you're going to drive the equilibrium over in this direction, that's why I've said this arrow here, but I'm not honestly not sure of the details required of this to get you one mark. I'm not sure, I'm afraid, which isn't a very good answer to that. I do apologise. I'll have to wait and see what the official answers say. Keyword here is filtration happening quickly. It's vacuum filtration. Um, why you recrystallise something? To purify it. Very simple. Infrared spectra. State a reason why different bonds absorb different wave numbers. I'm not sure what level of complexity they're looking for this here. Are they looking for the fact that different bonds are different strengths or just different physical lengths, which is also true, uh, and um, they have different resonant frequencies, but they're asking why they have different resonant frequencies. I'm not sure what they're looking for on that one. We'll wait and see. The wave number uh, of the peak caused by the NH bond, go and look it up in your data book. Um, 3400 was what I was finding in this uh, one here. That's why I've doodled that on there to find the actual number. Got to watch that scale, by the way. It'd be tricky to assume that was 4600. It's quite a nice question, actually. I like that one. This one here, this was a, this was a, a nice... NMR spectrum question, because it's a really nasty one. I think I got it wrong to start with. In fact, it'd be interesting to see if I get it wrong here. I reckon there are six. There's obviously one, two, three, four. And then I had initially grouped these two together, but that's not right. I think it's five and six. I think there are six different environments. Flavors of hydrogen. 
I'm going to look like a Muppet if I get that one wrong. You get to throw fruit. I predict splitting that the hydronine circled. I've forgotten which hydronines they circled. This hydronine here, the adjacent uh, carbon has got, well, there's no hydrogens in this one, and there is one hydrogen in that one, so we'll get a double splitting, or doublet is the proper name for it. Now, the, I thought this was a tough one. This actually forced me to go back and watch some of Professor Dave's videos on nuclear magnetic resonance for background detail. It causes hydrogen nuclei to adopt a high energy state aligned against the magnetic field. Explain that how this leads us to different corresponding environments. I don't know what level of detail, again, they're looking for here. The hydrogens will flip back again to the lower state and different environments affect this shift in flipping energy. But there's a lot more to it than that if you go and look it up. So I would imagine at advanced higher level, they're probably only looking for these two points. I could be wrong. I'll come back to the open enders at the end, oddly enough. Uh, splitting. Deorbital splitting is caused by the presence of ligands. The orbitals of the ligands, actually, interfere with the deorbitals of the central metal atom, and you get splitting. Outbound principle, very simple. Uh, electrons fill from lower to higher energy. Nice and simple. And then we have one that had me completely flummoxed. Now, I did this a few weeks back, so it would probably be good for me to pause the video and look at this again and see if I've found any inspiration. Yeah, I, I need a coffee, obviously, because I'm struggling to come up with any sensible ones here. It just says two conclusions. Now, are they looking to link the structure of the complex with the spin state? Or are they looking to link this P and delta and the effect it has on the spin state? I think that's what I was looking for. If you have a high value of the delta, then you tend to have low spin states. I'm not sure. I'm honestly not sure about this one. I'd love to see what the official answers are for this. I'd also love to see the examiner's report on how well this question was answered. I think I'll maybe leave this just now and come back to it. Uh, naming time. Yeah, if you can be bothered, that's the name. And lastly... Complete the diagram show the arrangement of the D electrons in cobalt hexafluoride. Um, hexafluoride or cobaltate, actually, technically speaking. This one here. Now, this is a high spin compound. How do I know it's high spin? Because it tells us up here. So, high spin means that we're supposed to split the electrons. That was the definition of high spin, which we'd never come across before. But my only question is, what do we do with the sixth electron? Logically, according to Aufbau, it should go into the lower orbitals first. We'll wait and see. Is that what they're testing for one mark? Or are they testing the fact that you realise that it's high spin? I'm not, because they've given you the separate box. I'm not sure about that one either. I'm not sure about that one. Okay, what's going on here? State one difference between a bonding molecular orbital and an anti-bonding. Oof, yeah. <sighs> What level of detail are they looking for here? Antibondings are higher energy. That is true. Antibondings don't actually overlap both nuclei, whereas bondings do as well, but that's pretty up there in terms of knowledge. I don't think I taught that to my guys. So I can imagine that this certainly would be accepted. This should be accepted, but whether you know it or not is a good question or not. They're also different shapes uh, to each other. Uh, fully why system trans isomerism can exist in some compounds with carbon carbon double bonds. Well, there's two points here, so I'm going to guess. Uh, yeah, I was struggling to see carbon to carbon double bonds. You can get rotation. When you have a carbon carbon double bond, it can't rotate, so therefore you can get cis and trans isomerism. Uh, and the lack of rotation is due to the presence of pi orbitals overlapping with each other, but I'm not sure if that's what you need to take the second point to explain why it can't rotate, perhaps. Rather than just saying it's got double bonds, because that's what it says in the question. I would imagine that might be the level of detail they're looking for. Let's move on. Blue light is used in this treatment um, because... What's going on here? Uh, oh, sorry, I missed this one first. Get your question right here. Internal hydrogen bond. Uh, what an unusual question. More like, uh, more like higher here. Internal hydrogen bonds, so any one of these two. Or I suppose you could have had that as well. Uh, that's not such a good one. That's not such a good one because this isn't polarised enough. I take it back. 
maybe that's what they're tempting you to do. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, that's possibly. That is not a hydrogen bond, so we'll skip that. Um, one treatment for John is to expose them to blue light, the yellow bilirubin. Yeah, it, because if it appears yellow, it's because it's absorbing the complementary colour, and that's why you have to shine blue light on the newly born baby. How funky. Um, what we got here, energy in kilojoules associated with blue light. It's a very simple calculation. You have to come up with this energy for blue light of that wavelength. Seven. Fully the procedure of weighing by difference. Okay, this is how we do it in the real world. You would tear the scale, you'd put the beaker on, record the mass of the beaker, you would add fertilizer to it until the required mass was in the beaker, and then you're done. But I'm not sure what level of detail we're looking for on this. So I'm not sure how they'll allocate the two marks to that. Good question. This is a really nice one. It's, um, it's a nice straightforward question. This two marks here. I think they tell you the yeah, they tell you the absorbance. 0.42. You find are we on great? Yes, we are. It comes down to there. That's the concentration. And then run through the calculations here. I'll just leave this. You can pause this. I'm not going to talk through this and bore you to death any more than I'm currently doing. I came out to have that percentage of mass by manganese, which is I thought was a bit small, but then again, I'm not a fertilizer expert. Lon Sand, looking for a characteristic of potassium dichromate as a primary standard. Take your pick. Any of these ones, I would imagine, should be acceptable for a primary standard. This was a three mark uh, calculation. What type of calculation was this? Titration. Okay, it's a redox titration, in fact. Um, did I think that was quite easy for three marks? I did. This will be interesting to see whether I get this one right or not when the answers are out. I know I've said that several times, sorry, but I'm testing myself. Explain fully how the violet colour arises in the oxidised form. Uh, it mentions conjugated systems here. Oops, mentions conjugated systems. Now, again, I've been reading up on this because I was a little bit fuzzy on this myself. And there's a lot behind this. But I think these are the two points they're looking for. Incoming photons are absorbed and I get promote. Sorry, incoming photons promotes an electron from the HOMO to the LUMO, the highest occupied to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And we see the complementary color. I think that's what they're looking for. Acid chlorides, formula for X. This was uh, an interesting one. How did I work this one out? I think I actually worked this one out because I didn't know this one. But I worked out simply by using the balancing numbers, working out how many atoms of each element were on both sides, and then whatever was left over that hadn't been used in here belonged in here. Which is an interesting, slightly bizarre problem-solving one. And then we flip over to the instant opposite of it, which is super simple definition. And a nucleophile is something that's attracted to a positive charge, or the equivalent thereof. Uh, add a curly arrow between the structures to show the nucleophilic attack step. So yeah, this is nucleophilic, this oxygen here. Um, and it's going to go in and attack that carbon. But I'm not sure. I've said that coming down there to release the chloride ion is probably optional because it says A arrow. A arrow? An arrow. Uh, the ester formed in this reaction? Well, basically, just plonk... Where are we? There we go. Just plonk this, uh, deduct that, pop it onto there, and you get this structure here. Uh, you haven't got your degree in chemistry yet, so you have to put all the H's in it, I assume, which is a bit tedious. The byproduct is hydrogen chloride. Does say name. I did that initially because I'm lazy, but don't forget to read the questions. State why chlorides are, f are preferred to carboxylic acids. Well, they are faster in reaction speeds, that's for sure. Um, perhaps you don't need a catalyst used. Sorry, cat. Uh, in reality, it's also this in the real world, by the way, in organic chemistry, this is easier to remove than water. Um, Acid chlorides react with some amines. 
Type of amine, so secondary amine. Very simple. The class of compound to which this belongs, when you react an amine with a uh, carboxylic acid, which effectively is what this is, you create an amide. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this is an interesting one. I, I'm not sure between these two. Technically speaking, it is a condensation reaction, but it's also really substitu electrophilic substitution. So I'd love to see which one of these, or both, are going to be accepted. Two marker. Um, simple, straightforward calculation there. See how we got on in that. I'll come back to the open enders at the end. Definition of antagonist. Uh, <laughs> skating on thin ice here, guys. Homeopathy. Homeopathy. Deary me. If you're interested, go and look up just how poor, non-existent, actually, is the science behind homeopathy. Every single time it's been tested in a blind test, it does the equivalent of drinking a glass of water. But anyway, don't let me rant. Sorry. Let's have a look. Uh, so, the, this is an interesting problem-solving one. Um, these are my answers. We'll just have to wait and see if they are correct or not. I think whoever has written this question is making the point that homeopathy is complete nonsense because you end up with six molecules in one litre of the solution. The, there can be conditions where there's less than that, so there are actually no molecules of active ingredient left, and that's why it's rubbish. So I sort of like this question in a way, um, because it pokes holes in homeopathy. On the other hand, if you truly understand your chemistry, then perhaps this question may wrong foot you, because that answer surely can't be correct. Also, uh, it's sort of using um, Avogadro's number, which we lost from higher chemistry when things were dumbed down a few years ago and that's a bit of a shame so I'm not sure how many people will get this last step correct but I uh, shall wait and see I shall wait and see molecular formula for caffeine uh, yeah it's just can you add up your C's, N's and O's correctly I'm pretty sure that's the right answer though again I'm going to be embarrassed and look like a muppet if it's not uh, why can they bind to the same receptors because they have similar structural shapes and features it's as simple as that that molecule there is basically just this one tilted on its side. Number B. Um, what's going on here? A single extraction of caffeine was carried out. Outline the steps that would have to be carried out to extract the caffeine. I'm not sure the level of detail or what marks allocation will be done here. The solvent and the solution are put in a separating funnel. You mix and shake them, and then once you've done that, you're supposed to vent them. But do you need to say that? I'm not sure. In the real world, you really do need to do it. Allow them to separate, and then drain off the bottom layer to separate your layers. Uh, this, I got an equilibrium going on here. This is effectively your product, so that's the right-hand side, that's the left-hand side. There's your volume, 32 milligrams. You do the calculations. Concentration of in the DCM, uh, that's dichloromethane, sorry, flipping into a note, shorthand notation. Concentration the aqueous, I think, are these two numbers here. I ended up with that number there. We'll see if I'm right or not. Suggest improvement that would maximize the caffeine extracted. Yeah, I go on back and I, I extract the single extraction with a circle there. That's not what you do. You do multiple extractions, uh, say, for example, three times, each with small portions um, of a fresh solvent. I've actually said three lots of um, three lots of 20, why did I say that? Oh, because it said in the question, 60 centimeters cubed, don't use 60 in one shot, use three lots of 20 instead. Or the equivalent, you know, multiple small numbers. Uh, this is an interesting one. Problem solving. To end up with never heard of Zwitter ions. I remember that from university a long time ago. Um, and what you have to do is follow the dominoes here as they zip around. And this is my opinion on Zwitter ions. Um, it's only worth one mark, possibly because it's quite complex and you end up with a positive charge on this nitrogen, which your brain goes, oh, I don't like that. But it can happen because of the number of bonds attached to it. And there's only one bond to this oxygen. 
Uh, that is it. Shall we retreat back to the open ender questions, ladies and gentlemen, and see? You don't want to watch me flick through this. Okay, this is a suitably uh, disgusting open-ended question. I like it. Comment on the likely pH range of human urine. <laughs> I'm not going to take the mickey out of this question. I'm, I like this one. Um, so, what's going on here? Uh, we, I, I reckon you could probably split it across maybe these three topics. These jump to mind for myself. Weak acids and bases. You could also talk about equilibria, of course, when it comes to uh, this, because weak acids and bases are all based on equilibria. Give an example of one. Of course, always give a chemical example. They love that sort of thing when it comes to... Mar it makes the marker's life so much easier. Uh, I'm not going to do that. You know what I'm talking about. It's going to be... Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I need my lunch. Um, CH3. And then that's separate hydrogen ion. Uh, so weak acids and bases, you can talk about them, maybe give examples, you can define them. pH of salts, you can then go on to talk about the fact that why salts have a pH, uh, if, they're acids, if, they're, if they're salts of weak acids and bases. And then maybe ionic product got thrown in there as well. You can talk about the fact that uh, water is busy doing its ionic equilibrium all the time. You could show the reaction that you quote the number from the data book. That's quite a nice one, a nice one to get three marks in. And this was our other open-ender. Haloalkanes can react with sodium hydroxide and elimination reactions and nucleophilic substitution reactions. 2-bromopentane with sodium hydroxide and ethanol. Analysis showed a more complex mixture of products using a knowledge of chemistry suggests how these products might form and how they could be identified right. So what you want to do is to get a couple of your marks. Uh, you might want to talk about nucleophilic substitution reactions. Actually, it leaves it nice and wide open. This is another nice one because they talk about elimination and nucleophilic substitution reactions. So you can do elimination and create uh, isomers, actually. You could create that or you could, of course, create that as your isomer. So you could talk about the elimination. You could talk about cis and trans, perhaps, with that as well, if you wanted to show off. You can also talk about substitution reactions. So we can pluck off the bromine and pop on a and OH, if it's in aqueous conditions. Um, you could talk about nucleophilic substitutions in general. You could describe it. This is 2-bromopentane, so you could maybe talk about the possibility of SN1 versus SN2 reactions. Uh, there's a lot you could talk about in this, so it really is wide open. And we haven't even got to the identification stuff yet, because... Oh boy, we've just come up really good in the lucky box here because you can talk about infrared spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy. So, yeah, that, that's a gift, really. Um, it's not too bad, this paper overall, actually. Quite like this paper. A couple of weird problem solvings, though. Uh, and I'm really stumped as to how some of the marks are going to be allocated. And that's why I don't work. It's just one of the reasons. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I don't work for the SQA. Thank you for listening, ladies and gents. Bye-bye.